Okay. So we are live on YouTube. Hey, YouTube. Yes. And we're live. Okay. Emily, welcome to Thank Check you. Great Thank to have you. Thank you so much. Thanks. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, we're delighted to have you. Uh, this is episode 13 of Check the Gate, one-on-one -on -one with the Northeast Filmmakers Lab. I'm Mike Moyne, and I'll be your host. Today's guest is Emily Best, CEO of Seed and Spark. Emily, you're an executive who's surviving COVID. You've recently told me that you just moved uh, two children. Um, could you use a beverage? Yes, please. <laughs> I'm parched. Uh, so I have some water here. Great. Thank you. Awesome. We'll now, be fancy and have it in a wine glass. Why not? This is what I've got. Um, and you're out all the way out in Sacramento, correct? Yep, I am. All right, here you go. Thank you. My goodness. It works every time. Um, oh, I feel much better. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm. <laughs> So Check the Gate is a weekly program supported by the Capital Cinema Cultural Exchange, a charitable nonprofit empowering emerging, fil emerging filmmakers to complete and present their projects in a rapidly changing media landscape. And boy, is it changing um, through the expertise of the Northeast Filmmakers Lab. Today's sponsors include Price Chopper, Market 32, not just in your neighborhood, they're your neighbor, Albany Wine and Dine Festival for the Arts, Josh Sellers Wines, joshsellers.com, Crew Me Up, Connect, Create, Collaborate, crewmeup.com, filmalbany.com, and yayflix.com. Next Thursday, our guest includes my good friend Reggie Harris, African-American singer-songwriter. We'll talk art, music, movies, and race in America. Registration opens tomorrow. Cinemaexchange.org. The term check the gate comes, what I learned, on a movie set where... Before you get to move on, you have to check to make sure there's no impurities in the lens. And uh, if the uh, first AC says everything's good, we get to move on. So with that, let's move forward. Emily Best is the founder of CEO and CEO of Seed and Spark, a platform built to make entertainment more diverse, inclusive, connected, and essential. She has raised millions in investment and crowdfunding, secured large brand partnerships, and built a world-class team for Seed and Spark. In addition to her work at Seed and Spark, she's produced films, series, and virtual reality projects that have premiered at Sundance, South by Southwest, Tribeca, and more. Her most recent series, FCK Yes, a new web series on mission to change the way we talk about sexual consent. Obviously, I, you know, as a Catholic kid, I just bumbled that through. Uh, I can't wait to see that. Emily has taught- We made it for you. <laughs> we made it for all the Catholic kids out there who were taught that shame is shame and pain are better than like fun. Oh, so we you. got you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, and my wife thanks you because we have teenage kids in the household. So perfect, perfect timing. Um, you've taught crowdfunding, pitching, and creative sustainability in more than fifty cities around the world. And you're turning your in-person community building efforts towards virtual efforts to help secure the sustainable future of creators everywhere. I hope. Wonderful. And we thank you for doing this. Thank you. And um, tell us, where did Seed and Spark get its Seed and Spark? Um, I never meant to be in the movie business. I was not a person. I grew up in Sacramento, California. Uh, I didn't know any, I didn't know there were jobs in the arts, actually. Like, I just didn't know that that was a thing. Um, <laughs> nobody told me that. Uh, and um, I would find myself in um, moving to New York in 2000 seven to help my dad launch his company. And prior to that, I had been running restaurants in Northern California. Um, and I had just like started waiting tables when I was 16 and worked every single job and every single kind of restaurant. And, um, 
had a few like lucky opportunities when I was really young to start managing. Saying that it's lucky to manage a restaurant is like a, <laughs> uh, I feel differently about that now maybe. Um, yeah. But uh, but I had a lot of business management experience by the time I was like 26. Um, and my last restaurant management job, I was a general manager of a 140 seat uh, restaurant with event space and I had 96 employees and um, built training programs and, and so was really into operations. Um, and when my dad was trying to launch his own consultancy and he was going through a really hard time personally and just having a really hard time with operations. Um, and I saw it as a, you know, as an avenue to move to New York and kind of start a new life for myself. Um, uh, I went, but like it, it was a brand new company. It like couldn't pay me enough money to live in New York. So I was waiting tables because that's how I know how to be in the world. Um, and when you wait tables in New York, all your friends are actors. Like that's just how it is. And they of course want you to do what they're doing. Um, and I had, I had done all sorts of creative things growing up. I had been a dancer, I'd been a singer, but like, you know, for fun. Um, I, I went to school after college to study jazz singing, but had lost my voice and really kind of given that all up. And, um, and so I, uh, I took, took an acting class and did just what all my friends were doing, which was I got headshots and I started auditioning for things. Um, and I had an absolutely insane thing happen, which is I booked the first thing that I auditioned for, which ended up being this just bonkers play um, that had 45 cast members. And it was a site specific uh, play about the Iraq war that we would end up doing two runs. We did like, I don't know, 70 shows or something like that. Um, and which for downtown theater is a lot. Like you often do not get to do more than 16 shows. Um, so, uh, so in the process of, of doing that show, I was like, this is really fun. It also runs really badly. Like, could I help this run better? Because that's what I know how to do. And I would discover that if you like to run creative things that has a job and it's called a producer. And I was like, oh, I have a purpose. I'm a producer, like that's what I do. That's like the right intersection of the things I know how to do. And so um, started a theater company, started producing stuff and, and produced a, a site specific play, um, a, a version of Hedda Gabler um, with this wonderful actress named Caitlin Fitzgerald who was like at the beginning of her ascent and she's beautiful, tall, blonde. And that is the least interesting fact about her. She's like one of the most well-read people I know and incredibly funny and, um, and yet she was coming to the theater at night to play Hedda Gabler, which if you don't know, is sort of like Hamlet for women. And during the day she was being asked to audition for pretty girl, pretty girlfriend, pretty best friend, hot best friend, sexy fiance, uh, exclusively. And it was the first time I ever looked up at movies and were like, oh, I don't see anybody I recognize or admire who doesn't die at the end, by the way, like Thelma and Louise, everybody likes to point to Thelma and Louise and it's like, yeah, did you see what they had, what they did to them at the end of that movie? Um, so it, it's, um, to me, it's really like, that was the turning point for me was just to recognize that film had created a fantasy world that became so divergent from my life that it made me realize it was probably doing harm to how people perceived me and all the women around me. And there was a reason that Caitlin was being shoved into a corner around her looks um, that wasn't just happening in movies, it was happening everywhere. Um, so we decided to make a movie and it was learning, um, it was everything, all of the challenges that we faced. Um, we ended up you know, having a really hard time financing this movie with a bunch of first time filmmakers, uh, even though we all had experience in our relative roles uh, in, in theater, certainly. Um, and uh, we would launch a crowdfunding campaign back when it was a brand new thing, but instead of doing it on these new websites called Kickstarter and Indiegogo, um, we would do it on our own website. Uh, and uh, and we, would, um, we would make it a wedding registry, not because um, we didn't trust those crowdfunding websites, but because we really wanted people to understand what it would take to make this movie and why we were doing it. Um, 
and it was really successful. Um, we needed to raise 20,000 in cash and we raised 23,000 in cash, but then literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans and gifts um, of locations and goods and services, right? Like people just driving to set and dropping off coffee and food and props and gifting us locations and a, a used car salesman in Rockland, Maine asking to read our script and then deciding that he felt like our main characters would drive these specific cars and we agreed with him and he gave them to us for the six weeks of our shoot. Like it was just unbelievable. It was unbelievable, oh. right? All the, all the things that, we, that came out of that. Um, but what came out of it more than that was that we had 450 email addresses of people around the world and we communicated with them every time the film screamed any, screened anywhere. And they showed up in droves and brought their friends because they felt like they owned a little piece of our movie, even though they didn't, they just like contributed 50 bucks or whatever. Or like I put the makeup on her face, whatever. Um, and all of a sudden these like sales agents and distributors who didn't want to talk to me before were like, what do you know about your audience? Can you tell me more about that? And I was like, oh, you have no idea who comes to see movies <laughs> and you're desperate to know who comes to see movies. So if I know who's going to come see my movie now, I am in the driver's seat. And that was very interesting to me. And I was like, I, and because I was starting to spend more time with filmmakers, I realized how unempowered they felt uh, around their ability to control the destiny of their movies. Um, and it was a magic year, 2011, because that was the year that Netflix went all digital. And the year that, I think it was the year or the year before that, that Canon put the full frame sensor in the 5D camera and made digital cinema available to everyone. So the world changed the year that I got into the movie business. And I didn't get into the movie business to be like, I'm going to be in the pictures. I got into the movie business to be like, I'm going to change the way women are represented on screen. And that I think is, that is the, that was the seed. That is an amazing story. And what a year, 2011, uh, just corresponds with when I was invited over to Russia and then the seeds for the Northeast Filmmakers Lab developed. Amazing. Because if the Russians can put together a producer's lab and invite me, an American, and I can learn about the European market, yeah. and they paid for one third of my airfare and housed me and fed me, then why can't that happen here? Right. We were talking about earlier about just how we look at art and, and <clears throat> you know, it's not funded. It, it, there are grants and things like that and you can jump through hoops, but it's it's a challenge for, for most of us, most yeah. filmmakers. Yeah. Um, that's just an amazing story. And it says so much. And I, and I, I totally get it now because that's a, a big part of why a distributor would take a chance on a film is if you can do their homework for them yep. and tell them who their audience is. Yep. This is the number, like the two reasons we want filmmakers to finish their films, but we also want them to know the audience that they're making it for at the earliest stage possible. Yeah. Uh, it's and the so more you know about that audience. So if you have their email addresses, if you know what cities they're in, if you know what platforms they like to watch on, if you know how they like to be reached, if you know how they like to be spoken to and marketed to, um, you really uh, come to the table doing a piece of the distributor's job and they view you as an asset, but that's an asset that should be monetized. So your deal structures get more favorable to you the more you come to the table with from an audience standpoint. And the other piece of it is when you just finish your film and wait to get distribution, then the distributor owns all of the information that comes from distribution. And you're, you don't get any of that, right? You have no way of really um, uh, understanding if their marketing tactics are gonna be effective. You have no way of understanding how it's landing with audiences. Um, and ultimately every single person I know who has done a deal with a small distributor has taken on the lion's share duty of putting butts in seats in almost every city where those are um, with their own innovative campaigns not the ones that the distributor is like helping them do. So even if you get distribution, which is not a thing you, you do, dis distribution is something you do, it's not something you get. Um, uh, 
Uh, but even if you get distribution, you're going to be doing a ton of work. And the more you are prepared, the more you're interacting with your audience and understanding who you're talking to up front, uh, the easier that work is going to be. And I just want to stop and say, um, I know how much anxiety that causes in filmmakers. They're like, I already have to like write, shoot, sound design, color correct. Like I have to have all this expertise and now I have to be in marketing also. And it's like, unfortunately, uh, yeah, but that's actually what building a business is. Like there is no business without a customer and the distributor is not the customer for your work. And we get, we get confused because they're, they're a vendor in the process. They are not the customer. And so many filmmakers treat distributors as customers and they're not the customer. Um, they're, it's, it's, a, it's like a competitive vendor environment, basically. Um, and the, the reason that's important is that uh, we spend a lot of time trying to get the attention of the wrong people and it gets in the way of our ability to make our film. And if you just go back to why am I making this thing in the first place, right? And the answer to that is often because I want people like me to feel seen. Great. So then your audience at its core is going to be people like you and the, and, and the people who know them, right? Fine. Start there. Okay. Cool. Maybe it's, um, I want to change a specific piece of legislation or I want to bring awareness to um, a certain like kind of mental illness that people don't talk about enough. Or I want to, if you go to the core of actually why you are using your talent as an artist to tell a story, finding the audience becomes less like terrifying and unspecific. And it's much more about like, if you could imagine in your mind, whose life would you change with this story? It doesn't have to be like, I was, for, it's like, like, who did you delight? I, my husband and I watched Peanut Butter Falcon last night. <laughs> and we got to the end of the movie and we were like, oh, thank you. Like we really needed that right now. We just really needed that. And I don't think, I mean, Peanut Butter Falcon was, was beautiful in its, in its representation of, um, and, and casting of an absolutely astonishing actor who also happens to have Down syndrome. Um, but he, it was just like a sweet, delightful story. And that created space for me, right? And it was really helpful to me. And it's, it's not because I think they necessarily made that movie being like, we're gonna change the world, but like you changed my life for a night and that really matters. And just really focusing on like, who are you trying to do that for? I think can really help kind of open up that conversation a little bit. I have never heard anyone put it quite like that. And that just allows you to pivot. If I, and I know we've got screenwriters on here, we've got filmmakers and folks, if you have questions, uh, you can uh, please place them in the chat. We'll actually try to pull you on so you can, you can speak to us. Um, just, just amazing, Emily. Thank you so much. This is this is like a master's class right here that you just boiled down. Um, people don't realize you can go to, you can go to get a master's in film school and still not come away with what you're talking about, which is, <laughs> which is the key in filmmaking today. Yeah. If you're going to raise money. Can I just tell you a funny? So I've traveled around the country, and many of my team members have traveled around the country teaching at festivals and universities. And we teach, we teach a course called Crowdfunding to Build Independence. And that course is really about building and growing a relationship with an audience. You do learn how to run a kick-ass crowdfunding campaign, but that's like not really the point of the class. And then we teach this distribution workshop that we developed last year after people were like, we have just no idea even where to begin. And we, we have taught at the finest film schools in all the land. And the students come up to us afterwards and they are livid because they were like, I had been at this school for three years and I have paid $200,000 that I will be paying off for the rest of my life. And this was more information that we, than we have been given in our entire, like they just lose their minds. And it's, it's interesting because um, so much of film school is treated as trade school, actually. Like you will, it's weird to say that, but like so much of film school is like, just learn the craft of filmmaking. 
And like, you send these kids out into the universe completely unprepared for the actual skill set they will need to have a career in that craft, unless you're trying to make them become crew, right? Like if you're a screenwriter, you have to be writing shit that is relevant to human beings. And therefore you have to have some sense of what you want to say to them, you know? And that's, that's different than like a three act structure, you know, or like the, what it takes to complete a screenplay. Like it's, that's very different. Um, if you're a filmmaker, like the skill set, you I think you have to think of yourself a little bit more. I, I hate, I hate conflating art and business in this way, but like I didn't choose capitalism either and I'm not happy about it. I'm just gonna talk about like what the reality is. You have to think about yourself a little bit more as like the CEO of your sort of production company or creative career where you have to be something of a generalist and every CEO has their particular talent. So if you're gonna go, if you think about sort of startup entrepreneurship. You have tech CEOs, right? These are people who started as engineers and they have a very specific expertise there. You have sales and marketing CEOs. That might be what I am, right? It's really good at like talking, telling a story. You have leadership CEOs, literally people who are just expert at like lead, building and leading teams. So everybody has their thing, right? You might be the screenwriter who also has a broader sense of your career or the director who has a broader, or the producer who has a broader sense of your career, right? But you have to think about this from a CEO standpoint, a CEO has to be obsessed with the customer in the end. Like whose life am I trying to make better with the thing that I'm doing? Who's going to exchange money for that? Or I don't live off of this. If you're not trying to make any money off of your work, cool. There's like lots of other ways to structure it, but I, I'm, I'm speaking specifically around like if, if inside this particular economic framework, which we're stuck with for now, although Thing changes afoot in a very positive way. Um, uh, you do have to think about creating value that people are willing to exchange money for um, that doesn't deplete the, the thing that you're trying to do and say in the world, but actually is synonymous with it. Does that make sense? I have no idea. I talk about this stuff so much that like after a while, I'm like, am I even... Well, even let, me, let me let me ask some of the folks here. Andy, Etienne, Sarah, Tom, uh, does this make sense? And and uh, what are your questions? Please uh, please send them in. Uh, well, I, I'm gonna um, just ask Emily. Could you talk a little bit more about who was in the space when you started, and um, and how is Seed and Spark different from? all the different platforms that are that are out there now. I don't even remember all the names of all the companies that were in the space when I started. I can I can I can close my eyes and look at the roster of faces of other CEOs in the space. They were 100% white guys back then. Um, and the companies have either folded or folded up into other companies since then. Um, Kickstarter and Indiegogo are still around. Obviously, Indiegogo is really not talked about as much in the film space anymore, at least not in my circles. Um, Kickstarter uh, obviously is, you know, is the Kleenex of, of crowdfunding for, for the world. Um, and then there were lots of distribution has like, has, you know, <laughs> when we entered the marketplace, everybody was interested in TVOD, transactional VOD. Like you could just rent a movie for $2.99 or $5.99. And like that was going to break open the entire marketplace. And then Apple and Amazon made sure to basically own that market. So then everybody started to shift towards these like streaming options and all these niche streaming services proliferated. And then Netflix basically was like, om nom 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 nom. And like gobbled up, just kept raising billions of dollars and like gobbled all of that up. And then inevitably, everyone, all the pro content producers that Netflix built their business on were like, hold on a fucking second. Like, why are we handing our content to you to, to build this giant monster off of? And, um, and now we have a marketplace that is just basically a bunch of streaming sites competing with each other very much to the detriment of the independent creator. Um, so the landscape has definitely changed a lot. Um, 
Seed and Spark, I think of more as a community development platform housed inside an entertainment studio. So we're really about how creativity shifts power to the individual and their community. Um, we've been dedicated to equity and inclusion. That's very core to what we do. But I would say that more broadly, we're just here for people who are mission driven in their work. Right. And when you're mission driven in your work where it's be, it's, it's beyond, I just want to like, uh, have a career in entertainment. And I, I want to be specific about this, like, uh, telling stories from Chattanooga, right or making rom-coms that center black stories. Like that is a mission right now. I'm not, I'm not saying that like there has to be a, a, a huge audacious world changing why like representation is its own mission. Um, and that can take many, many, many forms. Um, but there are a lot of people who are also like, I, I, yeah, I want to like make my career as a filmmaker, but like what really drives my work is like mental health awareness, right? Everybody, like a lot of people have that kind of drive in their work. And that's really what we built Seed and Sparks tools for, because that often takes a ton of collaboration, not just between and among filmmakers, but with organizations. Um, it requires a lot of education about how to align your business strategy and your mission. And that's really where that's where we specialize. So we start with educating filmmakers on how to align their mission and business strategies and how to use the tools that are available to us to do that. Um, and then providing a suite of tools, not all the tools, a suite of tools to help in that, right? So we're going to put some tools in your toolkit along the way that you can use. Um, and now where we're really focused is on the distribution side, um, making sure that there are lots of options available. So we just recently launched an online screening platform to, um, for film festivals to use, um, but also for groups of creators to curate content and eventize content um, through that. It's like sort of eventized screenings is really what that platform does. Um, and that's a way that filmmakers and, and festivals are advancing their missions. And then a big part of our business is actually an equity and inclusion training for corporations. We've built a whole curriculum for corporations around film. And that's a much more direct hit. Like we're going to take this movie and we're going to make it have impact. Um, and we're much more hands-on there. So, um, so that's like, does that become something more like the skull foundation and, um, and what they're trying to do? We're, uh, we're actually just, I'm just signing a deal with participant media right now. Um, uh, no, it's not a foundation. This is a for-profit business because, because companies, yeah, 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 especially right now, because for me, the importance is we can take this work, we can sell it into corporations and creators get paid every time a corporation uses their work to have impact. And that to me is the alignment between the business and the impact goals. Like, oh, you made this movie because you want people to really understand the experience of structural racism. But the film is not, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful short about this little girl's experience in school. Um, I'm speaking specifically about a film called Bad Things that I think is really incredible. And the, the, the director's statement on Seed and Spark is very much that like she wanted people to understand what the experience of structural racism is. I don't think she made that film being like, this would be a great corporate training video. Um, that's, that was not her goal. She made an exceptional film and we've been able to take groups of those and package them as curriculum for, um, uh, for corporations who are trying to build more inclusive workplaces. Um, and that filmmaker gets paid. The corporations have the impact. It's the alignment of all the goals. And so we've taken a much more active role now in aligning impact and money for creators. <laughs> Right. That's, that's a focus of our business this year. Wow. That's, um, and that's really like smart business and you're connecting the dots and you're connecting your audience with the money. Well, what I see it as is the problem with the digital environment. So yes, can anybody put their stuff out there? Sure. Who's going to see it? Well, the problem is that question is answered too much by social media algorithms that we have no transparency into whatsoever. And very often, if you are trying to change someone's mind, your social media algorithm is purposefully not going to surface your content to that person. 
because they're built to build echo chambers. So if you want to get your content to people who think differently from you, you have to do it differently. And for us, the corporations are a really interesting vector. It's going to put filmmakers stuff in front of people who would never otherwise see it. These are not people who necessarily self-identify as film festival goers, right? These are not people who give a shit if the film that they're watching is particularly representative. They don't even, they're not even in that conversation, right? But their corporations are making this program a vector for their professional advancement. And now we're getting to show these movies to people who could actually meaningfully be changed by them. And I have unbelievable case studies about how this is happening um, that are really exciting. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, my view is like that one of the challenges that we really have is overcoming the echo chamber problem, especially in mission driven work. What's the, um, the difference between a successful fundraising campaign and the, uh, the ones that just flounder and maybe they don't get to completion? Uh, Pre are, preparation, are there... pre preparation and hard work. Um, uh, doing a crowdfunding campaign is no different than shooting a movie. You need a significant pre, -pre it's like won or lost in pre-production. Um, and just so you know, like crowdfunding to build independence is a two hour class that answers that question. So I don't want to try to pay lip service to it in a short amount of time. Um, but but basically like making sure you really understand who your audience is, how to talk to them, um, and that you have really sharply articulated the value proposition for them getting involved in advance. Um, and then pursuing consistent and creative strategies for uh, raising that money over the probably four weeks that you will be doing it so that your audience doesn't get burnt out and you don't get burnt out. Um, and that's, we have a two hour class to that effect. But those are, those are really the things that make the difference. That if you are launching a crowdfunding campaign, thinking that the crowdfunding platform is going to somehow materialize the money for you, you are doing it wrong. And I'm not saying that it's, that's about every platform. If you launch, if you are building it, thinking they will come, you are wrong. So, um, uh, is there, do you host the two hour course that people can pay to attend or do no, you it's free? No, 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 it's free. We would never do that. So it's available on our site all the time. Um, and I can, do you want me to drop the link in the chat? Yeah. That, Cause would, that would be super easy for me to do. Um, okay. and then if you, so here, first off, it's better to go to them live because we do so many case studies. Um, so you can send people to seedandsparks.com forward slash events and our crowdfunding workshops are there, our distribution workshops are there, creative sustainability summits, lunch and learns. There's a ton of educational content. Um, and then I can get you, I do know how to navigate my own website, I swear. Um, uh, I will give you the direct link to our crowdfunding class, which is always online and always for free. Um, I don't even care if you take it and go to another website. I just want people to do crowdfunding well. <laughs> I'd prefer you use Seed and Spark, obviously, but like it will work. These, these, are, these skills are not specific to our platform. That's amazing, you know, and it's, you know, good karma, uh, we always say, comes back to you in some way, hopefully, right? Um, so it's really in the preparation. It's treating their fundraising like you're making the movie. Yep. Um, and um, how many people help you run uh, Seed and Spark? Are we 15 now? Um, we, uh, I should know, I like, I should know that exact number off the top of my head. Um, it's a little embarrassing that I don't, um, but we've, we've grown quite a bit recently um and you've moved uh, and i moved and and everyone just you mentioned before we came on about uh many are everyone's working remotely now is that yep the case so we have team members in um i'm in sacramento we have four or five team members in la and then we have four in new york and then uh, one each in Atlanta, Memphis, Birmingham, New Orleans, uh, Las Vegas. Is that right? right? Yeah. Cool. So we're spread out. 
we have strong in the Southeast now, which is cool. I'm excited about that. So we'll have to do a, a little work here to, to get to um, some folks um, connected here in the Northeast. Uh, Heidi Phillipson comes to mind. I think she was part of, of um, Seed and Spark. Yep. Um, does your company now have a position on diversity and race? And uh, how are you looking at all of this that is, um, we just leaped over all the COVID stuff because now we're into another chapter here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, how, how is all this changing? What this you're is, raising? That, yeah, so it's funny. We, we had to like take a pause last week and realize like, we've always been a platform for protest art. Um, our, the, at the very core, you go to any, like our mission page has not changed in the last five years and it's all about equity and inclusion. So like, we didn't have to do much because we've been doing this work a long time. Um, and all we did last week any differently was got out of the way and centered all of our black storytellers to make and made space for them, right? So normally it's really just about the like full intersectional diversity. And last week, like everybody else stepped out of the way. And, um, and that's work that we will be doing consistently moving forward. Um, but our community has been focused on equity and inclusion since its inception. Um, and so we haven't had to take a position. It is our position that it is the role of the artists to make the world work for everyone. Like, and, and that the business does not currently surface stories to do that. And so we have taken it upon ourselves as ourselves, like a group of scrappy ass creators, right? To, to make a model that will sustain creators to do that. Um, I was in a three day conference last week that was supposed to take place in Santa Monica. So I was able to zoom it from here in Albany from my home. Beautiful. And, it, and I was, you know, it's one of the things I see changing in the industry is just somehow I'm getting access to all these people I didn't have access to before. So it's a wonderful opportunity on, on that respect. But at the same time, all of this is changing. And there was panel after panel after panel of five white people, five white people, five white people. And it was just so obvious mm -hmm. that the decision makers is... Uh, is in need of a reboot of revision and change and, and the organizer said we need to do better. It's really interesting because I live in such a universe. So like my Twitter universe is made up of film Twitter, black Twitter and diversity and inclusion Twitter. So the, the folks who run equity and inclusion programs at corporations, like it is un thinkable to me that in 2020 somebody could put on that conference and not know and it's a reminder to me of the silos we live in because my world like there's there's just no universe in which I could even plan that panel right like somebody on my team every single person on my team would be like no right <laughs> like like there's just there's there's so many backstops it's not even funny and and yet there are organizations that still can put on a conference and not one of the speakers spoke up so like i won't speak on a panel that's all white people anymore like i just won't if you invite me to a panel that is four seats then we need to see like measurable equity and i will cede my seat if if it means centering a voice that doesn't look like me because like i also am part of i can be part of the problem if i'm not careful right um, so yeah, I mean, it, that's unconscionable to me, but also it's just really important to remember the kind of silos we're in and how much work there is to be done and how much educating there is to be done. Um, I love this question that Tom Doyle asked. Yes. Um, so because, which part of your work journey are you most proud of? Um, the thing that I'm most proud of is the team that I built. Um, it's like, the greatest pleasure in my life to work with these people every day and to cultivate an environment that is, is, uh, you know, enriching for us collectively. Like I'm not responsible for cultivating, like all of us together have decided to really like do this thing. And, um, that's been so uh, amazing. And the other thing, um, Tom, when I started Seed and Spark, 
it was a side project for a production company I thought I was launching. And I had three films on my slate, a documentary uh, and two features. And then I was going to work on this like side project. And I was out raising money for that entire, I was like trying to raise money for this like slate of films plus this like side project of Seed and Spark. And people just kept being like, I think you need to focus on this Seed and Spark thing. Like I don't, I, I think you're, uh, you're focused on the wrong thing. And so, you know, with my plans, I would have made three films in the first like four or five years. And instead, Seed and Spark has helped 2,200 projects get off the ground in that time. Um, and so if I think about like, you know, if I died tomorrow, I know that it mattered. And I like, I, I rest real easy you know, and I haven't made any of those films that I have on that place, not one. Um, and it's fine. Well said, well said. And isn't this a time period uh, where you really, um, uh, you discover what's really important to you? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're just, our, our lives have been changed. Um, and uh, uh, for me, you know, working on the projects that I, I really want to be working on, is, is what is my focus. Um, one of them is, happens to be on the student loan debt crisis. And another one I'm working on with Mr. Andy Maycock, who's here. Andy, uh, I'm gonna, are you still with us? I'm gonna bring you on. Andy, are you there? I am here. Yes, sir. Uh, so I, I know you've been interested in, in, this, um, in this discussion with Emily. Uh, You've got a couple projects that you're working on, um, big budget projects, some lower budget projects. So, um, what what issue is, is it that, as a writer, um, that you need the most help with in terms of fundraising? Well, geez, it's making that big leap, uh, as Emily said, from writer to CEO. You know, it's um, trying to figure out how to navigate that that big leap, where even if you're not going to be the director and, and in one of the projects I hope I will be but that's it's a totally different you know mindset it's uh, I didn't go to business school I mean I didn't go to screenwriting school either but and that's it's sort of a something you you, you pick up and you think well somebody someday will take this and run with it um, you're not really prepared for yourself to take it and run with it anywhere and when you I mean the world like you said the landscape has changed so much that now we we have the opportunity to run with it ourselves yeah but it's not that easy so it's it's yeah. just making that big jump and uh emily thank you I, I now have you know two more tabs open on my 35 tabs <laughs> uh, i to, see I'm you gonna, i am you <laughs> <laughs> um definitely gonna check out your uh your um in, in instruction uh, not instructional video but you know your your seminar there yeah um and I first heard of Seed and Spark a couple of years ago. It was associated with the uh, the Austin Film Festival, right? There was a mm -hmm. there was something connected there, and that was um, that was uh, in, encouraging. I don't know. It's it's it, we're sort of compartmentalized, and I think movies are too. You know, this this movie's for that audience, and that movie's for this audience. And yeah. um, you know, I, I'm a writer. I'm not a, a producer, but I, there are ways to figure it out. And I appreciate that that you've kind of boiled some of them down for us, but I am intimidated taking that first step to, to, to take that. Oh, Andy, oh, Andy's, so, not, Andy's not alone. And I always tell people, you've got to be a writer, yeah. producer, writer, actor, writer, something, writer, director. Yeah. Uh, so how, how do you, how does someone put that other hat on? So I would just say, Andy, I just a uh, week and a half ago, um, did a, a conversation with John Ridley um, who absolutely identifies as a writer, but really talks about all the steps in the process where you do and don't put your producer hat on that I thought was really valuable. That's That conversation you can find on our YouTube channel. It'll be right at the top. So if you go to Seed and Spark on YouTube, um, it was a four week writing challenge that he put forward, but he really talks a lot about the stages for a writer where you're thinking like a producer versus thinking you know, needing to really protect your creativity. And I think that is the biggest, uh, I'm just gonna use the most appropriate term for this is mindfuck, sorry for the language, 
um, is the context switching. Um, the, the context switching is uh, really challenging. And I was thinking about this yesterday. My, my daughter was like up in the middle of the night. I have a 16 month old and a three and a half year old. And they, they already wake up really early. And then sometimes, cause my daughter is quarantining, which I do not recommend. Um, she was up. And so I got, you know, four hours of sleep and then I woke up and we had, you know, morning time routine. And then I sat down and was doing work from eight to 10 and then from 10 to 11.30 giving feedback on, a, on the first assembly of a feature documentary I'm producing. And then had to go back into work. And it was like I was weeding through tar or I was like trying to get through tar in that moment of like my brain was like, I hold on. Like you didn't even give yourself a pee break in between these things. So I think one of the things is respecting the need for context switching and making the space for that clear. Um, because when I don't do it, it feels so painful. And when I do, I'm like, oh, look at all this like, creative energy I have, you know? So like, I do think that's really part of it is that like, you have to respect that you are making two completely different demands of yourself and not try to make them the same. And that's why I recommend, because John Ridley can, can say so much more about what it is to be a writer and a producer than I ever could, obviously. Um, so I'm recommending that because like, I think that was, that was kind of part of the master class piece of it. Um, Outstanding. Um, we have another question. I'm gonna bring Sarah on. Hi, Sarah. Sarah, are you with us? Yes. Hello. Hi, friend. Hi, Emily. Hugs to you. So, um, you know, all these years that uh, I've known you, many, um, I'm constantly um, amazed at the focus and just flat out energy and drive that you bring to your job and your responsibilities. And I just wonder how you where you find that I know you have an amazing team but come on you're doing where, I don't know, where do you get it how do you do it um she here before she started and came on you know she's she's got all these things lined up and no. <laughs> um I don't know um I'm definitely feeling myself getting older uh in this process um uh and I do think a team can help give the perception that you are doing all these things uh, that look like they're from your energy that aren't. Do you know what I mean? Like I get to talk about them. So I don't, I really can't underscore enough how much collaborators and team have been a part of it. Um, for myself personally, um, the more I have done this work, the more convinced I have become that creativity and storytelling is potentially the most important vector for reassigning power, um, specifically in this country, but also globally. And that shifting power is the essential work that our generation needs to do. We need to shift power away from white supremacy. We need to shift power away from, uh, you know, corporate greed. We need, to, we need to do a lot of power shifting. Um, and there are a lot of things I don't know how to do, but I do know how to work with creators and like, you know, galvanize creativity for community organizing purposes and also to help creators like really pursue their like business goals. And that's my lane in all of this. So for me, like being able to locate my work in the like larger need for generational paradigm shift has, is, is what keeps me focused. Um, yeah, I, that's all I can say. My mom will tell you that like, since a child, I just like organizing things, like making things happen. Um, so maybe some of it is nature. Um, but I do, I just, for me, the work is so located in like the call of our generation, I guess. I've asked because I've started um, 
at your behest, started listening to on my daily dog walks, um, Good in a Room, which has been fun. Oh, it's um, really fun. Yeah, super fun. Um, Cause you know, pitching, uh, not my strong suit. Um, but I've also been listening to uh, books by these entrepreneurs and things like that who are on the cutting edge, like you are. And I wonder about philosophies, um, just talking about very structural root stuff. Mm -hmm. Are there specific philosophies or books that you've read or things like that that might help um, other people with less structure learn it? Because I grew up with very little structure. So I'm trying to yeah. create my own infrastructure. One of my favorites generally is a book called Leapfrog Hacks um, that is very much about navigating the like business landscape. And this is much more on the entrepreneur side. Um, and it specifically targets women and people of color, right? Who face uh, just larger structural barriers. And that's the, the whole notion of the leapfrog, right? Is like, how do we leap over these structural barriers? Right. Um, because I, I, that, is a, that is a different part of a journey. Um, and I, uh, I, <laughs> there are so many people I follow and mentors I rely on that mm -hmm. I think it's, um, for me, it's been, a bit more like personal than, and I'm sure that means I am following somebody's philosophy and I don't necessarily know where to trace it to. Um, but uh, for me, it has also been building a really, really strong set of mentors uh, throughout the years um, and not taking any of what they say as the law, um, but really trying to like, listen to my gut in all of it uh, because I find that um, like hustle culture, the sort of like the startup entrepreneur hustle culture has really turned me off over the years. And I think right. I bought yeah. into it for a while. Um, I, I'm sure you saw recently, I like raged on Twitter about this whole notion of grit yeah. that we, we Love really, that. um, we really elevate this notion of the, the individual grit of somebody to like overcome anything because they just care so much. And like, nobody should have to work that hard to do a good thing in the world. Yeah. Grit is, a, is a, a fundamental, like it's a, it is a giant arrow pointing at a broken system. It is not an essential character trait that we should be lauding because nobody should actually have to have it to just like make their way in the world. Um, and so, uh, so I think for me, it has been like a process of chasing some of these more like culty, um, like structures and then trying to break apart, like what is the underlying, uh, philosophy and do I agree with it or not? And what I found in the last year is, um, I don't agree with most of it, actually. <laughs> um, and so- Sometimes there's nuggets. Yeah, there are lots of really incredible nuggets, but, but I, uh, I find myself now being like, nobody fucking knows how to do anything in a global pandemic, a civil war, and a great recession. Not a civil, I mean, it might be a civil war, I hope it's not, but civil, civil rights movement, certainly. Um, nobody knows how to navigate anything in that environment. So there aren't any experts right now. And so it's a process of like getting really quiet with the people, a few people you really trust and being like, what do we feel like is just the next right thing to do? Actually, that is it. This is just something my dad said to me years ago. I was like, can you get really quiet and figure out how to just do the next right thing right? And that has been core to me from for a long time because like it's it's much more manageable and actionable than like trying to go be Elon Musk, which sounds terrible. That was the very question that Terry Collins, uh, manager of the New York Mets, would always say: um, "What is the next right thing to do? Yeah. What's the next right play? I mean, yeah. shake it off and you know focus again." Uh, everything that you're saying 
boils down to one word for me and that is purpose. And you're constantly finding your purpose, which gives you energy yeah. and clarity uh, and uh, allows you to navigate through this. Um, I'm just looking at the time. I know you have to head on, head on out. Do we have time for a couple more questions? Sure. One. If, if, if my toddlers barge in and start demanding food, I will have to go, but yeah, go for it. Let's do okay. it. Okay. So we're kind of segueing into this question. I love to ask everybody if we could come out of this with a renaissance of sorts, what is missing? What do we need to do? What do artists need to do now in order to come through this whole period um, with a potential renaissance? Um, I'm going to take a slightly different angle on that because it's something I've been thinking about a lot because like I don't, I don't know if I'm prepared to speak to what the Renaissance will be. Um, uh, part of the way that the entertainment business has become such a great ex value extraction mechanism from its creators, right? Where it gets maximum value, but doesn't return that back to the creators, sort of gobbles it up in the machinery is by creating a really profound environment of scarcity. And part of that is in the story they tell us about how you're successful. And that is like, you just work really hard on this one script and you don't stop until the right manager reads it and they read it and they see how special you are. And then they fight for you and all of the mechanisms. And then you, somebody, the right person reads that script and then, uh, and then they pick you and then they make it and then it wins an Oscar. And like, that's the path that everybody secretly believes they're on because they've sold us this idea that actually to succeed, you just have to be really special. And that's a really fucked up thing to tell people <laughs> because that now you think it's about an essential quality and not about being really creative in the way you come to work. And if you actually look at the people who are successful, it's either that they have phenomenal structural privilege like nepotism or they've been incredibly creative in the way that they come to work, right? If you look at what Ava DuVernay did to build her career, what Justin Simeon did, what Issa Rae did, um, and I could, Stephen uh, Canals, who, who is the show, showrunner of P Pose, um, like these folks did not have the, they were not a Coppola. Apparently one really way to easy way to get in the business is to be a Coppola, right? Like, so, but if you're not a Coppola, you have to be really creative about the way you come to work. And we don't tell that story. Um, and we don't like to talk about how that behavior is rewarded. We like to tell the part of the story where the person was plucked from obscurity into, into, into fame so that we can reinforce this notion, but they were a really special case. And that's terrible for everybody. And what it creates is a terrible environment of scarcity because there's only a certain number of us who can really be that special. And, and so when someone gets picked, it means that's one less space for you to be the person who is special. And it creates a lot of competition in a place that, sh and competition of that kind is not particularly generative or creative or collaborative. It's destructive, it's ego-driven. It's nothing that produces like good, beautiful work. And uh, as a result, um, it's been really hard to get people to work together in certain ways. COVID hits and we're in now an environment of actual scarcity. And all of a sudden I'm seeing people being broken open to new kinds of collaboration because now where before they believe that collaboration might be tantamount to, um, you know, uh, going out of business or lack of existence. Now people are starting to see that without collaboration, they will definitely not survive. Um, and that is exciting to me um, because I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's proof that the culture of scarcity is in our minds. <laughs> Um, it's fabricated and it's, it's been a way to reinforce a power structure in the business to keep power away from creators and storytellers without whom the entire business does not exist. Um, so, so to me, there is a renaissance. If there's to be a renaissance, it's in the way we come to work. Um, yeah. 
that's my hope. And that echoes what some have said um, episodes ago, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Um, that's the way to get through this. And, uh, and, and there are people who, have, who can do that and are naturally bent that way. And others will have to work a little bit harder at it, but we're all being forced to uh, right now. Um, we call this the Abbey Singer. Um, why invest in the arts? What's the message to people who haven't done this yet or, or have the ability to do it again? You mean who have money to invest or put themselves in the arts? It could be either. Um, obviously, we want to support filmmakers uh, and, uh, and the arts in general. Um, so for people who, I mean, there are people who don't think they're artistic. There are people who don't know that $50 can mean a lot or $20 mm -hmm. can mean a lot and sure. makes a difference. I mean, uh, storytelling is really what separates humans from other animals. Storytelling is how we organize ourselves. It's how we, myth making is how we can like organize in societies that don't touch each other. It's how you can share beliefs with people you've never met. <laughs> That's all storytelling. So it is the single most powerful tool we have to influence how we are organized um, and how we see ourselves, each other, and the future. Um, so I don't know that I should need to say more than that um, because if that doesn't convince you to spend some of your expendable income on the arts, I just don't really know what would. You know, uh, you know, I'll take a little risk here, but the picture I had was, you're absolutely right. I mean, do chipmunks all get together and start start telling each other stories about what they're gonna do and where they're gonna go find their nuts and, and all this stuff. This is something that we get to do as a human species uniquely. We get yeah. to communicate with each other. Yeah. And, if, and if we're not very good at that, then we're really not going to, you know, add to the quality of our life. Well, we'll certainly, I mean, if we don't invest specifically in uh, stories that challenge the status quo, um, we're going to be stuck here forever. And I don't want that. Exactly. So, so that's why I have invested my life in the arts. Beautiful. All right. The, uh, the martini, the best advice you've ever received as a business executive about life, family, business, anything. It's funny. I don't know how applicable it is anymore, but a very old waitress who I worked with once told me, it ain't life and death, honey. It's just lunch and dinner. And uh, it's really incredible. And that was something that I carried with me forever. And when coronavirus hit, I have to say, the decisions that we're making took on a very different tenor. The decision whether to gather or not, or whether to shoot your production or not, it actually is starting to take on a little bit of life and death. And so, um, so I come back to the thing that my dad says, said to me, which is, you know, you just do the next right thing right. Um, and, and that, what I love about the space inside that statement is it also has to be right for you and for how you see the world and for, for your community and for your family. Um, and, and over the years, I have come to see those layers in it. You know, the first time he said it, I was like, right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So I just need to do the next thing that's going to like advance our business goals. And now I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, I need to do the next thing that is right for my you know, my heart and soul so that I can sleep at night and for my family and for my community. Um, that also factors into what my next right step is. So, um, yeah, it is definitely a guiding uh, principle. Great advice. And uh, our guest has, has been Emily Best, the CEO of Seed and Spark. Um, what programs do you have up have coming up do you have something today or next week you're doing all kinds of yes so um 
every Wednesday we host a lunch and learn. Um, and these are usually deep dives on, on specific topics um, uh, that will help advance your career. Um, and then we do creative sustainability sessions every week. And then we also host our crowdfunding and, um, and distribution workshops. And I can't even keep them all in my head because they happen with such frequency. Next week's Creative Sustainability Summit is on June 18th. And it's with three of my favorite stand-up comedians um, who they, they decided that the, the name of the session is Too Soon, Making Jokes in These Uncertain Times. Um, and it's really about like, how do you be a stand up comic right now? Like, how do you do comedy right now? Um, how do you build a brand? How do you build a career? Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited uh, about that one. Um, we're going to host, uh, there's upcoming sessions with Mark Duplass cracking projects with Emily V. Gordon, um, whose session I think is called um, what's keeping you from writing right now. Um, and she has an incredible background in, in mental health also. So that's going to be a beautiful hybrid session. John Ridley is going to come back and answer some questions. There's a, a, some really incredible sessions coming up um, apart from our regular fair. So seedandspark.com forward slash events is where you find all of that. Outstanding. And uh, is there also a, a place up there where people can just connect with a member of your staff or get help and if they have other questions. There yeah. are so, like so many avenues. You can reach us through Twitter and Facebook also, depending. And, and if you're, if you go to the four creators tab, you should be able to kind of navigate your way to the information that you're looking for um, and make sure you get to the right team member. Outstanding. Emily, thank you so much. Thank uh, you've you given so us much. So much. You're most welcome. Uh, really appreciate it. I look forward to the opportunity of sharing this with so many others uh, on our Facebook page um, and, and who, are, who are now finding us throughout the world. So I'm awesome. um, happy to carry on, help you with your mission. You help us with ours and you, love, yeah. love to have you come back. Let um, me know when and good luck to everybody. Um, have, a, have a safe and great weekend. Absolutely. Uh, and, and if I could just give another plug, the Northeast Filmmakers Lab will be taking place in November and our, our um, early bird deadline ends uh, like June 30th. So right now it's a bargain discount rate. Everybody who's listening, um, submit your short documentary work in progress screenplay uh, and get it in because uh, we're looking for you know, great projects and, and great people uh, to support. Thanks to all our sponsors. Thanks to our co-producer, Eric Volweiler, publicist, Tammy Reese, behind the scenes student intern, a great Dane from UAlbany, Luke Williams. If your business would like to sponsor a future episode, maybe you can't do it now, yet a year from now, uh, feel free to donate at cinemaexchange.org slash donate. Uh, tune in next week with our guest, African-American singer songwriter, Reggie Harris. We'll talk music, art, race, and movies. Until the next time, Emily, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Enjoy, enjoy thank Josh Wines. Be well, stay healthy, stay connected. I'm Mike Kamoy for Check the Gate. Our gate is good. Let's move on, people. Bye. Thanks, Emily.